Hello, I'm Michelle uh, Alanant. I, I've been a lawyer for about 20 years and um, I've been doing wills for most of my career, um, about 25% of my practice. And now it's wills and estates is over 50% of my practice. And I'm I'm on my way to becoming a certified specialist in the area. So I do have quite a bit of experience. Uh, the process that I use is not the process that everyone uses, um, but I do think that the, the activity of doing the things that I ask my clients to do to prepare for me is valuable in and of itself. Um, even if you, you know, don't end up getting a will or don't end up using my, my office, I think that the activities that I'm suggesting are, are valuable. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to just go over the questionnaire that I give to uh, my clients. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and we'll just go over the questionnaire and I'll explain why, you know, why that's so important. Hold on, let me just grab the right screen. There we go. Can everybody see that? I guess, um, I guess that's good. Um, so, and if you have questions, just type them in the comments. Um, Sarah, you can pop on and tell me if there's a question that I need to answer, but certainly there's going to be lots of time at the end um, for me to answer some questions. So obviously the basic things like your contact information, addresses and whatnot, you just don't wanna be spending the meeting with your lawyer, like having them transcribe information. It's not the most efficient use of your time. And you wanna use the, the lawyer's time, uh, you know, most valuably. And, and that's not, you know, not by uh, writing out contact information. Um, date and place of birth. So the place of birth can be important. Um, even if you're a Canadian citizen, but you were born in another country, um, I have a lot of clients that were born in European countries and they get pension income from those countries. And then also um, there's a likelihood that they're going to inherit property from relatives that still live in that country. Um, so it can be important. Yeah, that's complicated. Because <laughs> it might change the advice that I'm giving. Citizenship obviously is very important because um, it impacts on the taxation of your estate. So we do need to know your citizenship status. Um, even if you reside in Canada, if you're, a, if you're a citizen of another country, or if you have dual citizenship, we do need to know that. And I probably will ask a little bit more questions if you, if you aren't a Canadian citizen, um, or if you have dual citizenship status. So marital status. These are actually precise questions because married and common law aren't the same, divorced and separated aren't the same. They have different legal obligations. And um, so we need to know those answers so that I can ask the questions to make sure that if you have obligations arising out of any of these current or previous relationships, um, you know what they are, and then also I usually go through client with clients what the default is, um, what the law would decide if they didn't have a will, and that you know the marital status um, and previous marital status can impact on that. This will being made in contemplation of marriage, so the law in Ontario is changing, but it's still in effect until 2022. So law in Ontario has been, since we had um, wills laws, is that a will is revoked by marriage in Ontario. So if you did a will and you have since legally married someone, that will is revoked, it's no longer valid. Um, so when I have clients coming in that are in engaged, we generally make the will in contemplation of marrying their intended so that it's not revoked on their marriage. We won't have to do that after 2022, but for now we still do. Date and place of marriage seems like boring information, but um, sometimes when people are married outside of the country, their marriage isn't authenticated properly in Ontario, um, which can become an issue depending on how things go down with their estate. Um, I've had to, you know, I've had to have marriages authenticated by the court because there's there's some things you can go through in the Marriages Act to authenticate a marriage even though it wasn't properly registered, um, and sometimes you can't authenticate it because there wasn't enough steps taken to. Um, for the law to kick in. Previous marital history. So we've already asked about the status, but we just want to know like who are these, who are your past relationships? And ideally we want to see the document where that relationship was terminated, um, especially if there was an agreement with any future obligations. There's people that ha were, have been divorced for years, but there's still obligations on death to their former spouse. So that's really important for me to know. Domestic, oops, sorry, domestic contracts. So obviously separation agreement um, is important. That's similar to, you know, a divorce decree um, that would indicate if there's any ongoing obligations, if there's any, any ongoing obligations um, after death. And then also for parents of minor children, when they separate, typically one of, you know, they both have life insurance 
uh, in favor of the other as long as the children are minors. So we need to look at that and make sure that is that life insurance in place because if it's not, that's a charge on the estate and it would impact on how things would be divided. Um, other domestic contracts are cohabitation agreements or marriage contracts. So again, those can typically change the way that the estate would be distributed. Um, and those are important for us to look at. Um, we'll talk about corporations later, but even, even some shareholder agreements or, or partnership agreements are important for us to review because it, they do often have obligations on someone's estate after they die. Existing wills and powers of attorney. My practice is if you've done a will somewhere else, I try and get the original and then I have you direct me to shred it or I have you destroy the original. The reason being is we don't want multiple wills floating around after you die. Um, even if they're located in another jurisdiction, I usually work with a client to try and get them um, because we don't want any additional confusion after you pass away. You've taken the steps to do this will. Uh, we don't want someone saying, oh, I have this will from 20 years ago and I think that this is a valid will. We just don't want to have that. Uh, children's names, you know, basic information we don't want to be transcribing, but their date of birth is important if they're minors. Um, you know, we need to plan accordingly for, for their age. And if they're nearing adulthood, then I'll have a couple of other questions about um, if they want money held in trust and things like that. And then if they're, if they're not the natural children of, if there's, you know, a couple and it's a blended family um, or, you know, it's a, sometimes there's like a chosen child who's not formally adopted. Sometimes there is an adopted child. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that people can become a family. And it's important for me to know what the actual legal relationships are because we need to make sure that the documents reflect what the intention is of, of the people making the will um, and that they don't accidentally, you know, disinherit someone who's part of their family, but isn't, you know, legally um, part, legally seen as their child. So support obligations and other dependents. You'd think we already would have dealt with support obligations whenever we talked about the separation agreements and things like that. Um, not always, um, and other dependents as well. People support their families in various ways, financially usually, um, but sometimes it's, um, you know, if, you're, if your parents are the babysitters for your children, or, um, you know, if you take your grandmother to the grocery store once a week and take her to all of her appointments, that's technically um, a dependent um, situation as well. Um, and there is some legislation that provides relief for people who are dependents of a person who dies um, because they no longer have that, either the financial assistance or the other assistance that they would otherwise pay for. Um, so it's important for us to know who you're giving money and time and support to, to make sure that we account for that whenever we're doing your will. Because the last thing we want, again, is for someone to bring a claim and to have expenses of the estate. You know, we need to get ahead of these things. Promises you've made about your estate. If you have told one of your nephews that they are getting, I don't know, a classic car since they were five years old, we probably need to know that because if you give the car to someone else, there's going to be a problem. Um, or if you've sold the car, um, you know, maybe, or if you're selling the car, we need to, we need to just think about those things. And, um, especially when there's been certain expectations, uh, sometimes I recommend a family meeting to talk about what actually needs to happen versus what everyone maybe thought was going to happen. Um, you know, life changes and things like that. And uh, I prefer to be as transparent as possible um, when doing these things to the extent that my clients are comfortable because keeping secrets and having people think things that aren't actually going to happen is, is usually a surefire way to um, have someone challenge a will and make people hate each other after you've died. And I don't think anybody wants that. Other beneficiaries to be named. So name and relationship and date of birth if they're a minor and their address. So if you're giving things to close friends, um, colleagues, something like that, we just need some information to define who they are. Um, you know, for example, if they're, if they're John Smith, um, we're going to want to know, like, is John Smith your friend? Is it your uncle? Is it your neighbor? Things like that. Um, I see there's a couple of comments. I can just stop and see. Can I, can I clarify what I meant whenever I said that our parents would be their children, their grandchildren can be considered, can be considered dependents? No, so um, it would be, so if someone, if you're providing a service to another family member, then they are your dependent. So you technically are in some ways your parents dependent if they are providing those caregiving services to you. Um, so if, 
I don't know, your parent was providing those caregiving services and was leading their estate to a charity. Um, you know, if, if I was your parent's lawyer, I would say, I'm pretty sure we need to provide something for the child that you've been providing caregiving services to for the last five years. Um, you know, also they're your child, but um, you know, those are things that we look at. I hope that answers the question. And I think that might've been the only question so far. Let me just check. Okay. Um, sorry, other beneficiaries to be named. So we need the basic information, but we also just need you to confirm your relationship to the person. So, so we may define it in the will, or it might be important after you die to, to define that it was this particular person for this particular reason. <clears throat> Special concerns. So spendthrift is a word that lawyers use typically. I don't know if, if any of you know that word. It really just means somebody who's terrible with money for whatever reason. So do you have a family member that has an addiction? Do you have a family member that is seriously mentally ill? Um, do you have a family member with a disability? Do you have a family member that has a gambling problem um, that's been bankrupt, things like that? We may want to do some extra things if you're leaving money to that person. Also, family tensions are important. Um, you know, a lot of people have estranged family members. I don't judge any of that, but I do need to know the history um, so that we can evaluate the risk to the client and maybe what we need to do to prevent any future claims. Um, the other thing that can happen is that uh, I've had wills challenged a couple of times in my career. Um, we all have insurance in Ontario. Um, nothing has come to pass because I take really good records. I have this record and then I have my own notes. Um, so when a beneficiary who normally would otherwise inherit is excluded, um, I will ask really specific reasons why and take really good notes about that. And those notes have been used uh, a couple of times to prevent uh, a will challenge. Because usually once they see those notes, they say, oh, yeah, okay, I, I, I understand now. So financial matters, the first couple of things are just, we wanna make sure your house is in order. We wanna make sure that your taxes are up to date. Um, I do have clients often that haven't filed taxes in a number of years. Um, so sometimes I will refer them to help them get that done. Um, when someone dies and they haven't done their taxes for a number of years, it can cause a lot of problems. So, you know, part of this homework and, and cleaning things up is making sure that's done. Um, occupation, employer, and annual income. I don't necessarily need to know the exact income, but just a ballpark because sometimes um, life insurance is a, is a multiplier of your income. Also, depending on your employer, there's different uh, things that would happen on death, different pensions. Um, and then the kind of work that you do, um, you know, is there more risk? Do you travel a lot? Things like that. So, you know, clients who are traveling overseas uh, for certain kinds of work, we may want to think about different things depending on their assets um, or if they have a very high risk occupation. Um, I may canvas, you know, do you have appropriate life insurance? Like, are you protected? Are you protecting your family? Uh, Michelle, sorry, mm -hmm. there's just a question in the comments for you. Okay. Um, do you want me to read it for you? Yeah, no, I, I can read it. So if I write a will in Ontario and end up moving to another province or even a different country, can it cause complications or change the legal weight of the will? So typically when I have clients that have properties or assets in different jurisdictions, I usually encourage them to find someone in that jurisdiction to do the documents there and have us work together so that we're not revoking the documents. Um, sometimes they don't want that. Sometimes they know that they may be moving. Um, I always say I can do, I know that my will will comply with Ontario law. I can't guarantee it will comply elsewhere. Um, I will do my best. For example, if somebody owns like a small property in Florida and they, they do not want to do a Florida will. Um, I know specifically that Florida has different requirements about how things are witnessed that are different than Ontario. So if I know that I will make an attempt to, to comply with their witnessing requirements. Um, so that my client's documents should be valid in Florida, but I, I can't confirm. Um, so I usually recommend if you're moving to another jurisdiction, you should at least get some advice in that jurisdiction to see if you should change your documents. I would, I would personally recommend it, um, but I can't, you know, if you're moving to Alberta, I can't give an opinion on Alberta law. I do know that I've had clients that moved to Alberta and their lawyer did review their documents and said that they would be acceptable. Um, as an example, um, but Quebec is very different. Um, we're referencing different legislation, so the meaning could be a little bit confused. Um, and then certainly if you're moving to another country, 
permanently, I would recommend changing it because the laws are very different. Um, Ontario is a common law jurisdiction. Uh, Quebec is a civil law jurisdiction. There are many countries that are a combination, like the, the law is just different and the, the way the law works is significantly different. So that's generally what I recommend. But that said, I do, when I have clients that have properties in, in multiple jurisdictions and they just, for whatever reason, they're refusing to get advice in that jurisdiction, then um, I try and figure it out or contact a colleague in that jurisdiction to make sure that at least in terms of how the documents need to be witnessed, I'm doing that. Um, but beyond that, I, they're kind of on their own, sadly. I hope that answers the question. Um, I think I was on ownership in a is <laughs> ownership interest in a business. When I was a brand new lawyer, I had clients in. We went over some of this stuff, but they hadn't prepared anything in advance. Um, I didn't use a questionnaire then. We just kind of, you know, it was a free open meeting, and I tried to get as much information as I could. We made a lot of decisions, developed their plan, and then on their way out. I don't, I forget what I asked them, but they said, oh, by the way, we own half of insert well-known Cornwall business here. And I thought, oh, um, so what's the value of your share? Meh, about 800,000. I was like, okay, so can you sit down again? Um, because that that really changes things. If you own shares in a private corporation, there's, there's a lot of different things that we do. Um, but if you own a partnership in a business or if you have a, a side gig, an Etsy business, anything like that, there are different things that I would do or would advise you. Um, previous lawyers, I don't necessarily need to contact your previous lawyer unless they hold your will, um, but sometimes just knowing who handled your real estate transaction, um, you know, if you were to die and we needed that documentation, we at least know where to get it. Um, safety deposit box. Someone needs to know that you have a safety deposit box or a lock box and where the key is besides you. Um, it can be me, but the main reason I'm asking this question is because I'm going to ask you what's in it. Um, you know, if it's just some, if it's the, your original deed and, and things like that, I'm not that concerned, but some people hold cash. I have clients that have gold bars. Um, if there's something of value in there, I need to know. And also know if there's not much of value in there, um, it also is helpful if you were to die, we know that it's not necessarily urgent to get in there if we otherwise can, can access those documents. Um, accessing a safety deposit box at a bank after you die can be a little bit problematic. So, so knowing what's in there um, really helps me kind of let you plan for that. And also if I, if I, ha I usually go over these when someone dies that I've done the will for, um, I can usually give your executor some information so they know if it's urgent or not urgent. Uh, so next we're going on to like the nitty gritty of assets. I don't need to go over, I mean, basically any bank account that you have should be on here. Where it is, how you own it, is it joint? Do you own it in your own name? Um, and the average balance that you have. You know, most people have their regular everyday account, money goes in, money goes out, there's never that much money in it. But your regular everyday account, it means different things to different people. So sometimes I'll say, you know, do you keep a lot of money in that account? No, 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 not that much. Okay, well, how much is in there right now? And typically, well, about 40 or 50,000. Okay, that's different than my account that might have, you know, $400 in it today. Um, so, you know, I need to know if people are keeping a lot of cash in various accounts, why is that? And, and should you consider consolidating? Some people have bank accounts all over the place and, and that can make it complicated, um, whether there's a lot of money in them or not. And then also, if you I have at the bottom, if you own this account jointly with someone else, is it your intention that they get the account on your death? Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no. So a lot of people will be a joint account owner on mom's account. They're helping her pay her bills. But when they die, that's not their money. That money is divided among them and their siblings. So I need to know if that's your intention or not. Um, this is one thing that causes a lot of a lot of uh, litigation in estates. Um, so this is something that's pretty important that I ask. Um, and again, if they are saying yes, or if they're saying no, I clearly document why. Um, and I clearly document what their intention is so that if anyone ever challenges that after their death, I know my notes can be used as evidence. Rifts, pensions, and annuities. So, 
you know, the basic information, um, but knowing the value and knowing who you're naming as the beneficiaries and, and why you're doing that helps me look at the big picture. Um, the thing with RSPs and RIFs is when you die, it's like you cashed it in the day you died. So if you have $100,000 in your RSP, it's like you cashed that in on the day you died. So there's a tax consequence. But if you name them, your kid as the beneficiary, like your adult child, that's the estate pays the tax. Your adult child gets $100,000. So if you're giving your $100,000 house to your one child and your $100,000 RSP to the other child, the kid you're giving the house to is going to get the short end of the stick. So I need to know what you've done and what your rationale is for that, because if it was an attempt to equalize your estate, that's not going to work. Next is non-registered investments. So GICs bonds typically accounts where you can't name a beneficiary. And again, I'm going to want to look at what those accounts are and what their purpose is and, and why. Um, I think we have a question. Um, I think I'll address that question after. Um, it's about, um, uh, yeah, maybe, can you just re-ask it if I forget to address it at the end? It's just, it'll make more sense at the end. Um, sorry, non-registered accounts. Um, oh, someone's, I, I guess there's a delay. Um, so for non-registered investments, non investments, I don't know, somebody needs to mute or is it me? I'm not sure. Um, for non-registered investments, I'm if sorry, you have a lot of money in non-registered investments, there sometimes is a negative tax consequence. So I may canvas if there's any, like, sometimes there's things that you can do to, to limit the tax consequences. And also, um, if there's a lot of money in those accounts, then that, that's important for me to know um, to, in planning your estate. Like the value of your estate is important and, and what you hold and why is important for me to advise you. And then the bigger picture is like, what's important to you and what do you want? So I need to know the details. Sorry, Michelle, there's one other question in the chat if you'd like to address that one. I see that. Are there any problems that might arise using non brick and mortar banks? Uh, not necessarily problems, but that's why I, I do this. There's been so many times where people have done their homework or one member of the couple has done the homework and I'm sitting with the two of them. And the other one, I'll never forget this one. This was not that far long ago. The other one was like, oh yeah, um, I have this tangerine account. And the spouse is like, what? Uh, so the spouse didn't even know that account existed. If that gentleman would have died, she wouldn't have known it existed. She never would have thought to inquire about it. So somebody needs to know that it exists. Um, the other thing is that fellow also had cryptocurrency. So he said, well, I have a cryptocurrency account, you know, I dabble in it. And I said, well, what, like, what kind of money are we talking about here? It would definitely be a lot more now. And I think at the time he had like $30,000 in his cryptocurrency account. Um, if anyone knows anything about cryptocurrency, you basically, if you don't leave proper instructions about how someone can access it, if you die or become incapacitated, it's gone. Um, and his wife didn't know about that either. <laughs> um, so there's no, there's no serious risk, but if somebody doesn't know it exists, then that can be a problem. The other issue is just like, some of those places are just a little bit um, harder to deal with than a brick and mortar bank, but I, I wouldn't say don't do it. Um, no, don't bank with them for that reason. Life insurance disability critical illness. Um, it's important because um, not so much the disability and critical illness, although the critical illness can come into play when someone's close to dying. I can't tell you how many times people do their homework and realize they haven't changed their beneficiary designations from the person they used to be married to, or they still have their parent and they have three children and they've been married 10 years. Um, reviewing these things is part of what you need to do because it will help you make sure that things are up to date. It will help you make sure that your contact information is up to date. And it will just give you a chance to sort of organize your file, like your if I die file. Um, you know, this information is not only helpful to me, but it can be helpful in the event that you, that you die. Um, and sometimes what I say to people is just take like the first statement or like the most recent statement from all of these and shove it in a folder. 
even if it's 10 years later and you still have those accounts, at least that's a starting point. Um, ideally, you should update it more than that. But, you know, you have to organize the information in somewhere thinking if I die tomorrow, how are people going to find things? Um, and also, it's just a good idea to review all of your insurance needs and make sure that you're not overinsured, underinsured, and that you've got the right beneficiary designations. Um, and again, we may, usually I tell clients almost always that they should probably change their beneficiary designations based on what they actually want to happen. Um, other major assets. So people often think that they don't own a lot, but like if you own a four wheeler and a camper and a boat, you know, that starts to add up. So I always ask people about that kind of stuff. Um, any property items requiring appraisals? So the reason I ask this question is I don't know a lot about collectibles or certain antiques. And sometimes people's family members don't know either. Um, you know, they just think that dad was weird. He collected all these, you know, vinyl albums, but maybe some of the albums in there are like the, you know, the, um, Velvet Underground uh, unpeeled banana um, record, which is worth a lot of money. There's people who wouldn't know that. So it's a good idea if you have things that someone may not know is extremely valuable that you at least let me know or let them know if they're acting as your executor so that, you know, that album is not sold for $5. Um, approximate goods of, of how, value of household goods and furniture. This is just a ballpark. Um, but I just like people to think about what is the value of the things they have in their home. It's part of the value of their estate. Um, although most of the time, you know, used furniture isn't worth a whole lot. Um, but some of the questions I'll ask is, um, especially if I know that the uh, one of the people is a, a tradesperson, what's the value of your tools? Um, tools can be worth, you know, $60,000, even used. Um, you know, do you have a shop? Do you, what's going on? Do you, do you have, like, what kind of uh, other equipment do you have? Um, people sometimes forget about like how much jewelry, jewelry is actually worth when you've acquired it over a lifetime and sometimes it's been gifted to you. People sometimes forget about how much that costs. Um, so just kind of teasing out like what do you have of value and, and you know thinking about what you want to do with it. Real estate interest is basic. I just need to know you know the land that you own, how you own it, um, what the value is, if there's a mortgage. Um, and that's not just in Ontario. I, I need to know if you own assets outside of Ontario um, because that changes things. And then how you own property really changes things as well. Um, a lot of my younger real estate clients um, with the way that um, you know the mortgage approvals are going, often they are um, having to put their parents on title as like one or 2% owners. Um, so if whether you're the child or you're the parent in that scenario, it's really important that you're, you know, if you're doing a will that the lawyer knows, because we need to address what happens to that interest um, to make sure that it doesn't somehow, you know, something that, that isn't intended happens. Um, I do have one estate that I'm working on where the, the fellow died in another province um, with a will, but the only asset he had in Ontario was this 1% interest in a home where, because he guaranteed a mortgage with his child. Um, and it wasn't worth any money, obviously it was a 1% interest in a house, um, but it really hampered the ability for them to deal with the estate and it caused a lot of problems. Um, locations of personal papers and, and computer login credentials. Again, I don't need to know your computer login credentials, um, but does someone else, would someone else be able to figure it out? Or in terms of like looking at what your assets are, is somebody going to find the information they need? Um, easily. You know, I have estates where, you know, when people go to clean out the home, there's, there's paperwork in a closet or, um, you know, in unusual places, especially even in my own family, you know, my grandmother had dementia. Um, and my mother found, you know, like old insurance policies in the back of a, a nightstand and things like that. So um, just kind of an idea of where things are. And when you're preparing to do your will, just thinking of, okay, is, is somebody going to be able to find my stuff quite easily? Are you an executor or beneficiary under another person's estate or trust? So are you a trustee? Are you a beneficiary of a trust? Are you going to inherit some money soon? All these things can change my advice. And also if you know you're inheriting something soon because you know your parent has died and you know you're getting a large inheritance, that sometimes changes how we wanna do things. Um, 
and it, it might change my advice. Have you set up a trust to benefit another person? So that's just a lot of grandparents will have in trust accounts for their grandchildren and things like that. Um, we just wanna make sure that we know who's to benefit, that that account exists and what your intention is. And then other matters not covered. I mean, sometimes people have things that they need to tell me or that I haven't discussed, um, you know, certain wishes, things like that. Your debts, basically I just need to go over quickly what your debts are. And then I usually ask if they're life insured because that impacts on the value of your estate. I'm not saying that you need life insurance on your, your, your debts or not. Um, I just need to know so that um, it factors into the value of your estate. And also it might be a good idea for you to look at it. Um, I recommend to people that they register for free with Credit Karma or Borrow Well. Um, they're both free websites. Um, you do have to give them your personal information, but um, it's nice to review what accounts you have open, um, maybe go and close some old accounts, and then you can monitor. Um, so now I'm registered with Credit Karma. Um, I recently just leased a car and I got a notification that there was a hit on my credit. So it can be really helpful for you to monitor that, um, clean things up, and then also just make sure that you haven't forgotten about, uh, about an open account. All right, so now we're getting to the meat of the will. We're getting to the things that you need to start deciding. And sometimes you need a little bit of time to think about this. You need to talk to the people. You need to think practically about how things would go down. So executor and trustee generally is the same thing, but not always. The executor is really the person that will get the stuff done. Um, you know, file your taxes, sell your house, plan your funeral, deal with all that stuff. Usually they are also are the trustee of the money, but not always. Um, and sometimes if people are establishing a trust for like minor children, sometimes the executor is one person and then the person who will hold the money for the kids is another person. So you need to think about that. Is it, you know, who can practically get things done? Should they be the person to manage the money? Can they do it by themselves? You know, if I'm appointing my mother, you know, and my mother is in her seventies, should I appoint somebody as an alternate to her in case she's unable to do it? Um, I'm a big fan of having a couple of alternates. I've been doing this long enough. I've seen people, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in life. Um, you know, say your typical married couple with three adult children, um, they name each other and then one of their children as the alternate. They both pass away, you know, close together suddenly and the child that they've named as the only alternate is battling cancer um, or their spouse has died or they live overseas now. Um, it's hard when there's no other backup. The person typically feels they have to continue to act um, even if it's not really what's best for everybody. So I like having, you know, a couple of backups so that there's, you know, there's always a, a fallback. Um, I don't think it's okay. So, um, the broad powers is that's really just a note to me. I'll talk to clients about what kind of powers the estate trustee should have. Um, and we'll go over that. The specific gifts though, is, um, is there something special that you own that you want someone to have? Um, I had one, um, client where, um, they had Toronto Maple Leafs memorabilia and they wanted that to go to a specific person because they knew their spouse wouldn't want it as an example. Um, but also just the stuff in your home. Um, it's not worth that much money in a lot of cases, but what do you want to happen to it? Um, do you want everything sold? Do you want your kids to be able to, you know, choose sort of how it gets divided and then donate the rest? Do you want like grandchildren, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, my preference is not to be too specific, but to still think about how it's actually going to work. Um, Cause sometimes it's the things in your home, you know, the, the heirlooms and memories, those are the things that people fight over um, more than the money in some cases. So just take your time, look around, think about the things that you have and, and is there something special that you need to provide for? Um, cash legacy. So this is just pretty basic. I mean, you can give a cash gift to somebody if you want to, or to a charity. Um, you know, sometimes you're not giving, um, I don't know, your best friend a large portion of your estate, but you want them to have something. So you can give them an item from your home, or maybe you want them to have, you know, a couple thousand dollars or something like that. That's just a thought if you want to do that. 
also a charity. I mean, if, even if you're only giving, you know, $500 to a charity, um, you know, charities run primarily on donations. And I know a lot of our local charities really appreciate even small gifts. And there is a good tax consequence to it too sometimes. Um, so your home, um, your home, your cottage, um, any property that you own, do you have special wishes about that? You know, most of the time that's just a, a, a simple residential home. Um, people don't have a significant attachment to it, but if it's a family cottage, it's been in your home for generations or, you know, you're, you bought it from your parents and, you know, it's been in the family for 50 years. Um, do you need to do something special to say, ideally, I want it to stay in the family. I need to give you know, someone a right to buy it from the estate? Do I want to, um, you know, have my estate continue to own it and let my my uh, family members use it? Um, you know, you have to think about those things. Again, if it's, if it's a home that you've owned for, you know, five, 10 years, you may have no emotional attachment. Um, but if it's something like else, and you may want to talk to your family members, you know, the cottage may just be the cottage to you and you can sell it or not, but your kids may, you know, want to raise their kids there or something like that. So, maybe have a conversation about, you know, the homes and, and the, the, the properties that you own. Creating trust for beneficiaries. I, I ask about that because if you have minors um, or if you have, like I said, an, uh, a, a relative who has a disability or, or it, you know, has a, um, a gambling problem or, or some other reason, you may want to create a trust to protect them from themselves. And for minors, they can't inherit um, until they're at least 18. And in some cases, um, you may want to delay that. Um, you know, I I never hope that my uh, that my parent clients will die before their children are adults, but it does happen sometimes. And if you die when your parent and when your children are young, they're going to have enough troubles. Do you need to drop five hundred thousand dollars in their bank account on the day they turn eighteen? Um, that may not be the best thing. Some kids are super responsible and reasonable, and it's not a problem, but. Um, I do always consider with every client, is there a reason that we need to have a trust here? Let's see, there's a question. So uh, asking about me touching on blended families. Um, I, I can address this now because we do sometimes use trust to deal with that. So um, like I said, a will is revoked by marriage. So, you know, if you were married and um, you get divorced or your spouse dies and you remarry, and you make a will giving everything to your second spouse, um, when you die, they get everything and they have zero obligation to divide it among your family. Um, that is another thing that causes a lot of litigation. So there's different things that we do. One of the things that I do recommend is a spousal trust. So that means, you know, if I have a second marriage, my spouse would have the use of my estate, the use of my assets while he's alive. Um, but what's left over after he dies goes to my children. And that's one way. Sometimes there's, there's other things that we do. Um, but certainly if you are a blended family, it's not a simple will. Um, and you do really need to have a lawyer that, that knows this area enough to ask the right questions. Um, we sometimes recommend that you get a cohabitation agreement. Um, we sometimes recommend that we change the ownership of certain assets to make sure that they'll be divided. Um, so that is, that is kind of a minefield. Um, and if it's just everything goes to my second spouse, there's a very good chance that your children or your heirs will not receive anything, whether that's what you intend when you make the will or not. Um, you know, I could, I could die and my, I don't have a husband, but my husband could live and then become incapable. And if the person who's managing things for him doesn't know our deal or doesn't like my family, you know, it's not, you're not just fighting against the person that you're married to and the person that you love. Um, there's a lot of other things that can come into play that are beyond your control. And, and um, you need to think about kind of worst case scenario. Disposition of the residue. I don't think anyone uses the word residue except lawyers and people who deal with like silt and stuff. Um, so the residue is like the pot of stuff left over after you've paid your taxes and expenses, after you've dealt with those personal items, after you've given any specific gifts and whatnot. It's the pool of assets left over. It's usually the bulk of the estate. So where do you want that to go? Um, 
if you're married to your spouse, if you're not married, where's it going to go? If you're giving it to friends or siblings, what happens if one of them dies before you? So we sort of go through a lot of that. A lot of time is actually spent on, okay, what do you want? How are we going to draft this? And then what happens if those people, this happens? Um, so there's a lot of like plugging holes, I say, um, because most of those things will never happen. Um, it's very unlikely that uh, parents of adult children, you know, all of the children and parents and the grandchildren were per perished in an accident, but we're doing the will. And as a drafting lawyer, I just need to make sure that I'm not creating a situation where there's going to be part of the estate that has nowhere to go because that's an intestacy. And then the legislation kicks in and, and it makes things more complicated. So there's a lot of like hit by the bus, worst case scenario. This is probably never going to happen, but what would you do if it would discussion that we have? Um, and, you know, we talked before about uh, if you are providing services and money to certain family members, they might be your dependents. Um, but there's no, like, other than if you're already providing money um, or they're your minors and they're actually your dependents, there's no obligation for you to give money to anyone. So, like, if you hate your family, um, you don't have to give them anything. Uh, you know, if I have a lot of clients that are estranged from their family, they're estranged from their parents or their children or their siblings. and you don't have an obligation to give those people anything, but I'm going to ask you questions about why you're excluding them and why you're, um, you know, giving gifts to certain people, because I, I need to make sure that you are protected in the event that, you know, the typical beneficiaries um, make a claim, but also I need to make sure that um, if you're suddenly giving all of your estate to your next door neighbor that you've known for three months, like, why is that happening? Um, I need to make sure that you, capacity, that you are not being pressured, um, things like that. Guardian of children. I mean, we, I could do a whole session on working through this issue. Um, it's hard for parents to figure out how, who would take care of their kids if they're gone. Um, I think the first place to start is if you don't appoint anyone, who's going to step forward? Who's going to fight over your kids? Is that the person you want to raise your kids? In a lot of cases, it's not. Um, so think, start there. And then no one's going to be as good as you as the second thing. So you need to, no one's going to be the same as you and your kids are going to have lost you. It's going to be challenging enough. So who might, you know, work best in that scenario, taking into account all of the things that are important to you. I do think we might be, Sarah, I think we are doing the guardian thing maybe in one of the future sessions. Yes, we are on June the 2nd at 6 o'clock. Okay, <laughs> so um, we can talk about that in that session, but um, I know I, I recognize this is a really hard thing for um, parents and uh, sometimes it's the thing that prevents people from doing a will. Um, funeral, burial, other things. Sometimes we don't think about that, but... Um, the last thing you want is for your loved ones to have like no idea what you want and to be stressed out about that kind of stuff. So if you do have certain wishes, just let people know. Um, Cause like cremation or burial, like, I don't know, do they want to serve? I don't, like it, they can really stress people out. They just lost their loved one. And then they're afraid they're going to make like the wrong decisions and not honor you properly. Um, so, you know, you don't have to prearrange your funeral. You can, it's very helpful, but at least just kind of say, hey, like, just cremate me and like, spread my ashes in the St. Lawrence or something. Like, just let people know what your thoughts are. And if you want a funeral, if you want a, a, a mass, if you don't want anything, if you want a, a party, if you want an Irish wake, it might not happen because your estate trustee can, can override your wishes. But at least getting people an idea of what you want will certainly make it easier after you pass to make decisions. Um, other special powers or clauses is probably something that I would discuss based on the needs of the client. And the next thing is powers of attorney. So the will is you've died. Someone needs to deal with your assets. Powers of attorney are you're still alive, um, but you're not capable and someone needs to deal with your assets and with your health care. So there's two powers of attorney. I, I'll go over this quickly because I know we're getting to the end of the time and I want to have time for questions. Power of attorney for property and power of attorney for personal care or health care. You don't have to have the same person for either. 
you don't have to name the same person that you named in your will. Um, you can name more than one person for any of these roles. So you can name more than one person as your executor. You can name more than one person as the guardian of your children. You can name more than one person as your attorney for property or personal care. Um, but just think about like practically speaking, who is the best person? My brother's probably going to kill me for saying this, but I wrote a blog post one time about, you know, choosing your executor, choosing your attorney for property. And I said something like, you know, your brother might be a wonderful person, but maybe not the best person to do paperwork and deal with finances. And after I posted it, my brother said, was that a dig at me? <laughs> um, I love my brother, but he is not the most organized person with finances and paperwork. And I said, honestly, not when I was writing it, I completely didn't even think about it. I was thinking like objectively, but yes, like I wouldn't appoint you for those things. It's not, it's not the best role for you. And he said, thank God. <laughs> Um, so, you know, if you have a family member that just is not great with paperwork and it's just not their thing, they might not be the best person or you can appoint them with someone else who's like all business and really good at being organized and then the two of them can work together. Um, and for your health care, depending on what your wishes are, I know a lot of clients will specifically not choose some of the people closest to them because they don't think those people would be able to handle making difficult decisions if they were really ill. Um, it might not be the case for you, but um, it's something that you need to consider. Um, and again, think about alternates as well. Um, and one of the things that we need to think about when we're doing the power of attorney for, uh, for personal care, for healthcare, is um, do you have any sort of end of life type wishes? Uh, do you want to die a natural death if you are terminally ill? Um, so that's sort of the no heroic measures clause. Um, do you have other wishes? Like, um, I have one client who didn't want her haircut. You know, if she was incapacitated, she didn't want her haircut. She had very long hair and didn't want the person acting for her to cut it. Um, do you have wishes about like what kind of care you want? Um, especially clients that have some sort of degenerative illness, you know, MS or something. Um, we will go through things in a bit more detail because they may say intubation, yes or no. Um, I have Jehovah clients where we go over things in pretty specific detail based on, you know, what they are comfortable with. So, you know, you can consider all of those things as well and who's going to honor your wishes the most and who's going to be in the best position to make those decisions. And if you're naming someone who's not one of your close family members, are they going to be able to work with your other family members? Um, the other thing to consider is if you're appointing one person for property and one person for healthcare. They're going to need to work together a little bit just because obviously your health care is expensive um, and they need to make sure that your care is paid for. So maybe don't appoint people who like hate each other. Um, you know, I, ha I have one estate right now where the two children hate each other with a white hot intensity of a thousand sons. And I cautioned my client against naming both of them because I didn't think they'd be able to work together. Um, but that was what the client wanted. And um, the client is, is very old now and, and nearing death and it doesn't look like it's going to be all that fun. Um, so that's something to consider as well. And that's everything. I can stop sharing my screen and answer some questions now. So I know there was the one question about, um, okay, what if, so the question that I said I would wait um, for is what if a parent who is remarried dies, has no will, what happens for their assets, finances, house, etc.? Is it only next of kin or do the children still get their share? So Intestacy rules vary. That's sometimes why we also ask those questions um, because not everybody who does the questionnaire ends up um, retaining me. Um, so in Ontario, if you are a parent, okay, well, I'm gonna go through it. I'm gonna go through like the hierarchy. So if you are married and you have no will, if you're legally married, your spouse gets the first $200,000 of your estate. And then if you have children, the spouse gets one third of everything over 200,000 and the children are, get the two thirds of everything over 200,000. If you're legally married and if they are your natural children, again, I could do a whole other seminar on um, uh, DNA kits and surprise relatives because that's causing a lot of problems. Um, and that's also why I ask about relationships, because if someone is, you know, not um, a blood relative, but is your child's for all intents and purposes, we need to define them as that way. Um, so that's kind of generally how the intestacy works. If you are a, a 
parent with children, a married parent with children. If you are not married, um, it would just be the children. We distribute it equally among the children. If you have no children, we would look first to see if you have living parents. So it'd be divided among your parents if your parents were living. If you have no living parents, it's divided among your siblings. If you have no living siblings or if a sibling has predeceased you. Um, so the deceased sibling share goes to nieces and nephews. But if you have no living siblings, then it's all to your nieces and nephews. And the legislation actually uses um, after that, after nieces and nephews, um, it's called uh, relatives of equal degrees of consanguinity. Um, so we're looking at like, we're looking pretty far afield um, at that point. Um, some people say, well, I'm dead, I don't care, but um, like people that you don't even know are going to be inheriting from you. Um, you know, you could benefit a charity. If you really don't give a crap about your family, you can benefit a charity and, and you know, they would certainly appreciate that. Um, I just posted on my, my page today a, a case about um, a fellow in Ontario, um, he died with no, no blood relatives. Um, he had a long term co common law relationship. So the, the daughters of his spouse were like his children. Um, they had no right to inherit. So the province is probably going to be looking to find any potential heir of this man who probably didn't even know they were related to him. And the two children that he basically raised get nothing. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty sad. Um, someone's asking about the cost of doing a will. So with me, um, sorry, my dog is playing in the hallway. <laughs> I apologize. Um, my fee for an individual to get a will and power of attorney starts at 550. And usually most of the time, it's not that much more than that, unless you own a business and, or you have, um, you know, a, a relative with a disability and we need to start doing trusts and things like that. Um, and for a couple, it's, it starts at 900. It just depends on the, um, on the requirements. And what I offer is, you know, I do three meetings. We do the initial meeting where we go through the questionnaire we just went through. Um, the second meeting we review drafts and then the third meeting we sign. Um, and if you, I don't know, change your mind a month after you sign and you're like, why, dear God, why did I name my brother? I need to change it. Um, there's no cost for 90 days to make those changes. And then um, part of what I offer is I do reviews every, well, I don't necessarily call clients. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but I offer reviews. So if you want to come and see me in at least no earlier than three years, um, three years, five years, whatever, um, you can come, we can do the same meeting where we review everything that we just reviewed. We review what's changed and whether or not you need to make changes. There's no fee for the meeting. Um, there's a fee if there's changes, obviously, but I have a lot of clients that do those reviews. They've sold their house, somebody's died, something like that. And they're like, oh my God, I need to change my will. And then we look at it all. And I say, well, actually it still does what you want it to do. I mean, you can change it if you want to, but it, it still is going to work. Um, so then, you know, oftentimes they don't, they don't make a change. Um, if, if cost is a concern, um, you can get your powers of attorney done by, um, there is a kit through the attorney general's office. So a power of attorney kit through the legal, through the um, attorney general's office. And I think the library used to keep copies, Sarah. I don't know if they do, but you can get it online. Um, if you need a paper copy, I believe uh, Jim McDonnell, our MPP's office has it. Um, Eric Duncan, uh, our member of parliament may also have them at his office. Um, so sometimes if people wanna do that themselves, then I reduce my fee. Um, and, you know, people always ask me about the, the will kits. I try and give people self-help options like the power of attorney kit. Um, the thing is with the power of attorney kits and with a will kit or with a holograph will, all of those things can be valid. The reason they're usually not valid is because of something that lawyers do. So for the power of attorney kit, for example, um, it does give you very clear instructions about how it has to be witnessed. Um, people still do mess that up. So they, it may not be valid if it's not witnessed properly. Um, the other thing is that um, sometimes those power of attorney kits are used to like basically facilitate abuse person is not competent to be signing and someone is getting them to sign the document, making them attorney. Um, a lawyer would be canvassing capacity, uh, making sure that the witnessing was done properly, canvassing for undue influence, things like that. Um, and then it's the same with the will. You know, it's, it's people do the will kits, they don't get them witnessed properly, they don't fill them out properly. Um, it, it gets confusing. So like I'm not saying don't do it, I'm just saying there are risks to doing it. 
um, I wouldn't necessarily bank on it, but if you, you know, finances are a real concern, um, I would at least, you know, do those, do those power of attorney kits, follow the instructions to a T and make sure that you have proper contact information for the witnesses. That's another thing. Um, we usually need an affidavit from whoever witnessed the documents when they're, when they need to be used to authenticate them. And people sometimes just have like their next door neighbor from 20 years ago that, that witnessed and like they're, they're gone they're They don't know where they are. Um, so I've had problems with that. You know, otherwise the document was valid, but we couldn't, we may not be able to authenticate it because we don't have a witness. Um, sometimes we, sometimes we can do things, but it just makes it a little more complicated. So with, with a lawyer's office, we do the, the, um, the affidavit right away. It's done, you know, and also lawyers have insurance. So I don't, I don't do my own will. Another lawyer does my will. Um, obviously I have input in it. Um, but, uh, if something is screwed up, I want to make sure that my estate has access to the lawyer's insurance. That's why lawyers have insurance in Ontario because they can occasionally make mistakes. And if a lawyer makes a mistake that really, um, significantly screws up your estate, um, they've got lots of insurance to help your, your ears with that. I know we're close to running out of time. I guess I talked a little bit more than I thought. Um, I, I am looking in the chat if you wanted to ask a question now, or you can just ask it um, if you're comfortable. Sarah, do you have any questions? Um, I, I, I'll let other people go <laughs> if they have a question. <laughs> you usually have questions, so. I just feel like we're running short on time. So yeah, you guys can like unmute if you'd like as well and just ask if you if you have to go. Michelle, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, this was really great. So I took some notes. I may contact you. Um, very informative session. Thanks so much. Chantal and I grew up together, so. <laughs> yes, indeed, this Michelle, this was, uh, this was uh, very, very informative. Thank you for doing this. And thank you to the library for staging this as well. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, sometimes it, it's the, the homework part is very valuable in itself. Um, and I hope everybody here sees the value in like preparing and thinking about these things. Um, and it makes it less scary, I find, when you prepare, although maybe I'm just an over preparer. Um, I guess one more thing that I can mention if there's no actual I think questions. actually Denise has her hand raised. Did you oh, okay. have a question, Denise? I actually sent two messages. Did you not get them? Sorry, no, I didn't get, I didn't see any. Did you send them to everyone? I'm not sure. Okay, well, um, you can I'll ask them now. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, the second one was about advising young, uh, young adult children about getting their own affairs in order. And the other one was, what if we don't have that someone to name as executor or power of attorney? Right, um, okay, so the first one, young adults, um, I think I had talked to Sarah. I don't know if we're going to, we're going to schedule it, but I suggested that maybe we do like in July or August, uh, a session on, you know, preparing students going to university and college. Um, in my opinion, everybody over 18 should at least have a power of attorney for property and personal care. Um, the reason being is, you know, you don't want, you know, your kids at university and they get into an accident and you have no ability to do anything to deal with the university to cancel the courses, whatever. Um, a will is, is ideal just to appoint someone, um, you know, if a young adult dies, it's a tragedy. And the last thing you want is to make it harder on the, their loved ones left, left, um, after, um, the other thing is that children going to, to school in other jurisdictions. So we've had people where their children were going to school in like New Hampshire or something. Um, I have a colleague in New Hampshire, she prepared the documents. We signed them in my office. Um, so that because the rules there are very different about um, medical um, information, things like that. So it is really important for young adults, even even at college age, to be doing it. Um, that said, as soon as they have a, an apartment and a job or a house and kids, like it's really important at that point. Um, even if you just have an apartment, who's going to clean out your apartment after you pass away? What's going to happen to your stuff? Even if you just have the things in your apartment, those things mean something to you. And you want to make sure that they go to someone that you care about or someone that can use them. Uh, the second thing is, um, sorry, the question was uh, if you don't have anyone to name as an executor. So I will go over that with clients. We'll talk about who we could possibly name. Um, it is, it is some people just don't have anyone and sometimes they're naming like a niece or nephew that they don't really know. Um, if there's a lot of assets, I do sometimes recommend a trust company. Um, and some clients have asked me to act. 
I usually say no. Um, in some cases, I have said yes if I'm the alternate, or in one case, I know that I'm supposed to be acting with um, another professional. Um, the reason being is that it's costly for, it would be costly for me to do it. And in a lot of the states, it's not like I would be, I would be using up most of the estate assets. Um, that said, like we, we do talk about it. And sometimes, you know, when people ask a few more questions, they ask a few more people in their lives, um, especially knowing that they're having a will done that my office can offer significant amount of assistance to the person. Um, there's a little bit less resistance, but yeah, that is a problem. And that's why going through this and thinking, do I have anyone like at all? Um, is a good exercise and if you sometimes people just make the appointment with me because they're like i don't know who to name and this is what's preventing me from doing a will like let's talk about this um, and so we can review that any other questions um, i'm going to email sarah the questionnaire that i just went over so you have it um, the other thing that i can email is um it's a personal inventory it goes in a little bit more detail than what this is the personal inventory is a really good idea to prepare, like I said, get all, you know, when you I said get all your statements and shove them in a folder. The personal inventory is a really good idea for that, although it does have sensitive information, perhaps. Um, so sometimes I tell clients do it, put it in an envelope, sign it and just leave it with me and I'll give it to your executor. But it, it also reminds you of what you need to tell people. So if you've got a pet, who's the vet? Is your pet on medication? Like things like that that you might not think someone needs to know. Um, and also, in, even within families, sometimes there's one person who's the information keeper. Um, you know, somebody, the other partner doesn't know, like, where their insurance is with or what bank they're with, you know, depending on the dynamic. Um, and if you're a single person, like, is anyone going to know, like, where to start? Um, so I can email that personal inventory, and it just again, gives you an idea of what people might need to know. You can use that form, or you can just kind of I sent an email. Um, the last time I redid my will, I sent an email with a lot of details to all the people who might need to know anything. Um, and my mother replied saying, you know, you're not going to die, right? <laughs> I was going away. Um, and I made some pretty significant changes. Um, but they all know what role they have. They all know where to get the information. They don't necessarily know what the information is, but they know where to get it. Any other questions? I think we're kind of over time, but yeah, we're a little over time, but yeah, uh, yeah I'll definitely email that to everyone. Um, but if there are no more questions, we can wrap up, I guess. Thank you. I hope that this was helpful. And now you've got your homework. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm really happy Thanks. to have you here. And thank you all for showing up and the great questions. I think this was a really great discussion, but have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you too.